In the first two centuries AD, great caves were hewn out of the mountains in the western Deccan. Enlightenment, the great truth beyond the world of forms, was the focus of meditation. The creative forces and the joy of life in the world were represented in divine yakshas and yakshis. These were filled with a sense of well-being and the fullness of life. In central India by the first century, the Toranas or the gateways of Sanchi were completed. The enlightenment of the Buddha and the path of Dharma were represented by symbols which were universal to all religious streams in India. Yakshas, Yakshis and the deity Lakshmi were presented in the art. In the plains of the Ganga and in Gandhara, in the first two centuries AD, images had come into being of the Buddha, Jainatirthankaras and of Hindu deities. The fertile valley of the Krishna River was the cradle of civilization in the eastern Deccan. By this time it had become famous in the world for its fine textiles, particularly of cotton. There was a flourishing trade with Rome and large quantities of Roman coins have been found here. This area became one of the greatest centers of Buddhism and over 140 early Buddhist sites have been listed in this region. The Buddhist site of Amravati is on the bank of the river Krishna, next to the ancient capital of Dharnikota in the present-day state of Andhra Pradesh. The history of the stupas at this site covers at least 1400 years, from the time of Emperor Ashok in the 3rd century BC. By the 1st century BC, the stupa was enlarged and sculpted limestone slabs with narrative sculptures were added. This drum slab shows the Buddha's enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. The footsteps and the parasols indicate his presence. The shallow relief, broad faces, turbans and heavy earrings are reminiscent of other Shunga period art. In the second century AD, the Satvahanas extended their rule to the Eastern Deccan. Under them, the sculptural reliefs of the magnificent stupa reached its culminating phase. The entire stupa was covered with shimmering limestone slabs with exquisite sculpture. An ornate stone Vedika was also added. Today, only a mound remains of the Mahastupa or Great Stupa as it is called in inscriptions. In its time, its glory was known throughout the Buddhist world. Fortunately, we have an idea of what the stupa looked like from depictions of it in the sculptural reliefs. This self-imaging of the monument is a tradition which continues from here onwards in Indian architecture. The Mahastupa was 162 feet in diameter. The railings were richly sculpted. Their pillars, about 10 feet high, had full-blown lotuses in the center and half lotuses on the top and the bottom. 
The lotus, which rises in beauty from murky waters, is a pan-Indian symbol of purity and transcendence. On the inner surface of the pillars were made narrative carvings of the life of the Buddha. The stories are told in greater detail here than was done earlier at Sanchi. From the first century AD onwards, artists in North India, around Mathura, and in the northwestern Gandhara region had begun to depict deities in human form. Earlier, symbols had been used to indicate the presence of Buddhas and Jaina Tirthankaras. Artists in the western and in the eastern Deccan took more time to break away from earlier conventions of the art, in which personalities had not been depicted. It is only in the second century that the Buddha was depicted in art in the Deccan. This pillar narrative depicts the great departure. Prince Siddhartha rides out of his palace to renounce his worldly life. Below is the first sermon of the Buddha. The artist prefers to use the symbol of the chakra to depict the Buddha after his enlightenment. The coping of the railing is fully adorned with eternal themes. Often, a thick and luxuriant garland is depicted. It is reminiscent of the vine of the fullness and bounty of nature, which was seen in the second century BC at Bharhut and later at Sanchi. It is carried by turbaned youths who would represent the urbane city dwellers of the prosperous Krishna Valley. On entering the hallowed enclosure to circumambulate the great stupa, the worshipper saw exquisite carvings on both sides of him. On his right, the drum of the sacred stupa had slabs that were about six feet high. Sculpted dome slabs rose another 11 and a half feet above the drum. A world of Buddhist narratives was created through which the worshipper moved as he went around the holy stupa. Sculpted scenes such as the birth of the Buddha would transport the viewer far from the everyday concerns of the mundane world. His soul would be lifted in response to the beauty and grace before him. In the rapt attention and divine contemplation on the faces of the attendant figures, the artists appear to have portrayed the devotion within themselves. It is a realm of gentleness and beauty which awakens the best within us. The Chitra Sutra, the ancient treatise on art making, states that the purpose of art is to transform us through the presentation of harmony and grace. To show us a glimpse of the eternal which underlies all of creation. The reliefs of the second century at Amravati are deeply cut, which gives them the appearance of being fully in the round. The depth of the cutting permits the overlapping of figures on two and even three planes. Each figure is individual and possessed of life and movement of his own. The variety of poses is infinite. The artists are confident and appear to discover new possibilities of the depiction of the human form. 
there is a vitality and rhythm in the closely grouped compositions. Activity is contained within a sense of grace which prevails on all forms. The figures portray a quality of surrender to the harmony of existence. The sumptuous richness of the carvings is a fulsome celebration of the divinity which is all around us. Since the Indus Valley civilization, India has been well known for its flourishing trade. Great centers of art have come up at junctions on internal and external trade routes. Greeks, Parthians and others who stayed in India took to Indic beliefs and expressed their devotion to deities in numerous inscriptions. Commerce brought people from far away parts of India and elsewhere together in a spirit of mutual understanding and appreciation. It is such a spirit of warmth and giving which is contained in donative inscriptions of this period across the whole of India. Here too, in the Krishna Valley, donations of sculptures were made for the benefit of all sentient beings of the world. The exquisite phase of the Amravati art was under the rule of the Satvahana rulers. They were devoted to Hindu deities and were fully benevolent to the Buddhist Sangha. However, as in central and western India, this was an art of the people. The individual pillars and sculptures were the donations of lay people and the monastic community. Nuns outnumber monks in the donative inscriptions and many of them hold high religious titles. Everywhere in ancient Indian inscriptions it is seen that women enjoyed a high economic and social status. So what emerges from a study of the inscriptions is an understanding of the social fabric of ancient India and the wide range of people who contributed to the monument. And what becomes apparent is that women played an especially important role. In fact, the women folk of the royal court were often the chief patrons of Buddhism, while their husbands and the other princes in the court were supporting uh, old traditional uh, sacrifices in, in the Vedic mold. Besides the Buddha figures in the reliefs, a number of freestanding Buddhas have been found at Amravati and other sites of the Andhra region. They date from the 3rd century onwards. These are quite different from the Buddha figures which were being made at Mathura and Gandhara and show an independent artistic conception. They are dignified and serene. These were to be the models for the Buddhas of Southeast Asia. While the glorious Mahastupa at Amravati was made and sculpted in different stages from the 1st century BC till the 3rd century AD, many other stupas were made in the Krishna River Valley. Their railings and drum slabs are a vast surviving corpus of the early art of Buddhism. In the 3rd century, the power of the Satvahanas began to fade. However, the tradition of art which had blossomed under them continued. The Ikshvakus came to power in the second quarter of the 3rd century and established a new capital called Vijaypura or the City of Victory 
in the Nagarjuna Konda Valley. The great Buddhist teacher, Nagarjuna, one of the most important proponents of Mahayana philosophy, was known to have lived here in the 1st or 2nd century AD. The area continued as a most important centre for the development of Buddhist philosophy under the Ikshvakus. A large number of monastic establishments were founded here for the residence, study and worship of at least four different sects of Buddhists. Unlike Amravati, the remains at Nagarjuna Konda have been systematically excavated and securely dated through inscriptions to the 3rd and 4th centuries. The original site was submerged by the making of a dam in recent years. However, the edifices were carefully reconstructed and preserved for the future. In the Indic tradition, theology was never confined by dogmatic beliefs. Early literature is full of accounts of public intellectual discussions between the teachers of different sects. This climate in which different sects and philosophies coexisted is seen in the remains at Nagarjuna Konda. Chetya Grihas with stupas are made next to shrines with statues of the Buddha. Worshippers of both share a common vihara or monastic residence. The style of the sculpture here is very similar to the last phase at Amravati. The figures are lively and full of movement. They are cut deep into the stone. The tradition is continued here of the depiction of the stupa on sculptural slabs of the monument. The Gandharvas, who bring offerings, are a constant motif in Indic art from the 2nd century BC. Queen Maya gave birth to the Buddha while standing under a sal tree. The artist depicts her in the continuing style of the Shala Bhanjika, who presents the flowering abundance of nature. Her name, Maya, means the illusory nature of the world of forms around us. It is there as a reminder to the devotee. In Indic philosophy, it is constantly stated the deities are but a means for the realization of the truth, not a final aim in themselves. The great departure of Prince Siddhartha is depicted. Divine beings hold up the hooves of his horse Kantaka so that he may ride out of the palace silently. The creative force of nature is expressed in yakshis, whose mere touch causes the trees to blossom. These continue as a theme from the earliest tupa railings of Bharhut. From the rock-cut Chetya Grihas of Karle, from the first century AD onwards, yakshas and yakshis are also seen together. In their affection and togetherness, they represent the harmony and completeness of the natural order. As in the case of all major Buddhist monuments since the 2nd century BC, these were made under the rule of kings who worshipped Hindu deities themselves. However, 
in keeping with Indic traditions of dharma, they were fully benevolent to institutions of all faiths. As was often the case, some female members of the royal family were devoted to Buddhism and made personal donations to the monasteries. A number of Hindu temples were also made at Nagarjuna Konda during the period. However, none have survived. The belief is in the oneness of the whole of creation. The sculptures were made, as donative inscriptions proclaim, for the benefit of all sentient beings. The artist continues to present before us the grace which underlies all that is around us. That grace, which is also deep within each of us, and we respond to it when it is presented before us in art. Earlier, the art brought to us the vital and living world of nature, in which man was only one part of its existence. The focus has shifted. Some of the joy and frolicsome world of creation has been left behind, as the emphasis has come more on men and women. <laughs> 